you know, what really changes the world is people realizing their in, infinite capacity to improve. And I just go, if you could wave a magic wand and got everybody to overcome their fears, their doubts, to do more of the things they wanted to do without fear, I just go, what kind of a great world would that be? I don't know about you, but when I think about VCs, I think Patagonia Gilets, a love of super fast growth companies and not a small amount of humble bragging on Twitter, which is why my chat with Alex Dunstan surprised me in the best way possible. As well as investing in the likes of City Mapper at Sarch Invest, co-founding The Bakery and now chief of staff at Redbrain, which is one of the fastest five growing companies in Europe, Alex also happens to be a brilliantly curious, self-aware and just down-to-earth person. We talk about his journey of self-discovery and finding meaningful work, including a chance encounter with a magician, getting over our internal hang-ups, vulnerability and dealing with chaos from his perspective as an entrepreneur and investor, as well as not being boring on Twitter. If you're feeling a little bit lost, perhaps due to everything that's going on in the world, Alex gives us some really interesting perspectives on how to refind your path. So I'm very excited to share this with you. Without further ado, let's get started. Hello, Alex. Welcome to the show. So I heard yourself describe yourself as a curious explorer monkey in Metalus podcast. Um, a few months ago and you obviously have this very curious mind and I want to know how you can cultivate that and is it something that you think is natural to you or is it something that people can learn? Yeah so the thing that I was talking about was there's this um, super smart woman called Helen who got a double first at Cambridge but she's like really really dyslexic and can barely speak but she basically came up with a new theory of you know how the world evolved and it was basically and I will butcher it but basically my you know my 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 summary of it was that you know when we evolved there were basically two types of monkeys they were like the mechanistic production monkeys they were like get the banana cut the banana you know repeat 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 but like 30 percent of the monkey population evolved in some way to be curious and go hang on a sec what happens when we run out of bananas? And they were the ones who, you know, they swum through the sea, they went over mountains and loads of them probably died, but they just, you know, have this thing in them where they just explore the world. And you can see it in the artists, in the creators, in the entrepreneurs in the world, you know, you can actually sort of play with it and go, you know, you've got management consultants, maybe are the mechanistic ones and the entrepreneurs are maybe the more explorey ones. And so, you know, there's definitely something innate and in the genes of people who are naturally curious. I guess I'm one of those. I've got some form of ADD as well. So somehow my brain is wired just to make connections and explore new things. Um, And so, yeah, it's for sure innate. I think one of the struggles was, well, what the hell do I do with this? Like, I'm the kind of guy who I could listen to YouTube and go down rabbit holes all weekend. And I used to get really annoyed with myself. I used to beat myself up. I'm like, why, the f- why can't I focus? Why can't I do that one thing and just be really great at that? And it was only, you know, probably the age of, you know, late 30s where I was like, well, actually, this is a strength. And it's that classic thing of where you go, you know, uh, I think it's judo versus karate. Should you focus on your strengths or should you um, focus on making your weaknesses better? And for years, I had massive imposter syndrome. I was like desperate to, you know, be as good as everybody else in everything. And so I spent all my time trying to overcome my weaknesses. And it was like a revelation to me where I'm like, no, 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 no. Just accept who you are, accept what you're really, really naturally good at and double down on those things. And so I think the answer to your question is, um, it's a process of self-awareness and it's a process of understanding yourself at the deepest level and then just making choices on where to spend your time and actually surrounding yourself with a network of people who understand you and let you be the most you. Uh, Like one of my things now is I try and spend 
uh, you know, my definition of work is meaningful work with people you love and the people who I know I can trust and who can empower me to be, you know, without sounding all woo woo and Oprah, the best version of me is definitely where I thrive personally. Um, and you know, in, in, in work that creates the best environment. So long process of self-awareness and just working out where I can use that most effectively. And, and it's been reflecting my career. I started in advertising. I went and started a company with two co-founders at the bakery and exited that last year. I've been a VC for seven years now. I'm now uh, doing a chief of staff role at a company called Red Brain. And all the time just building this, what Adams calls it, the talent stack, this range of different skills that hopefully make me somewhat unique and non-replaceable in the world. Um, because, you know, I'll never be the best in the world at one thing, but, you know, I can write, I can do ads, I can do venture, I understand finance, I understand tax, I understand people, I understand persuasion. Like, there's a bunch of things that I've just built up over time as a skill set, which, you know, perhaps as a package, not many other people have. Yeah, that's interesting. That's something that in our courses we talk about is you have to look into the past before you can really understand where you're going in the future. Everyone's had a completely unique past, right? So you have to look at what you've done and what skills you've acquired over the years because no one else is going to have had exactly the same experiences and skills as you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think having that ability to kind of look retrospectively at things and understand it, it's almost like understanding what your unique kind of combination of superpowers are and that then informs kind of where is best for you to then go in the future but it's also psychology right like you're brought up one thing that i found i've done all sorts of crazy things where i've tried to you know dissolve the ego in some way and try and get closer to who, who i truly am but we take on other people's expectations all through life and there are a bunch of things where you have told yourself a story that you're no, you might have said you're no good at maths, but that might have been you had a bad teacher. You may have uh, told yourself that you're a horrible person because you got dumped by your girlfriend. You hold all these things and these stories that we tell ourselves in our mind. And like, it was amazing to me how many beliefs, schemas, thoughts about myself I held in my mind that were, I was just holding me back. I had hang-ups about money. I hang out, had hang-ups about being liked. I had all these things that, you know, and you talk about helping people be entrepreneurs. Most of the people that you talk to will be people who've just ended up really comfortable in safety, psychological safety. I feel safe. You know, the tribe isn't going to come and, you know, steal my house and ravage me if you sort of take it back to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. We all like safety. Um, and so we create these mental models that protect us, right? And they're useful to us. They're useful because they stop us, they create order in our world and they stop us going mad. So they're useful, but sometimes you just need to treat those voices in your head like a little soldier in your head, you know, stick them behind a cage and sort of say goodbye to them a little bit because, you know, skills is one thing, but I just find that the thing that really unlocks people, um, is if you can also work to break down that psychology and that, that sense of the known. Um, yeah, because the world is, the world is the truth of the world is the world is chaos. There's, there's a, you know, if you look at the yin yang symbol, there's chaos and order and the line in the middle is harmony. And like one of my favorite analogies about the whole of life is that, you know, life is the constant balance between chaos and order. If you had too much chaos, you fragment. It's too much. You know, we've all had bad things happen. People die, COVID situation, like too much bad stuff happened. You fragment, there's too much chaos. When, what do you do then? You bring order to your life. You give yourself safety, structure, things that get you through every day. But then a lot of the people you might talk to will be, you know, too much order. They've created this real sense of order. And what happens then is stagnation. People just don't grow at all. And so it's just one of my favorite life analogies. Think the yin yang symbol, one side chaos, one side order. It's always this balance in between. Are you too much chaos, too much fragmentation, need order, too much mm. order. You now need to step it up. You need more, you need more growth. Um, yeah. Stagnating. That's what people describe as the entrepreneurial mindset. You need to be taking action that treads that fine line between order and chaos, because if you stay in order, as you said, obviously you're not 
growing. But yeah. If you go too far into chaos, you'll have a mental breakdown. So you kind of yeah. need to be taking action on that boundary between order and chaos to stepping slowly into the unknown. And, and that's where the growth happens. And like all of these things, I think it's self-awareness, right? So if you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're just in chaos, right? Like there's no order. So one thing that I say to entrepreneurs is, well, where can you get order? You need some. Is it the people around you? Have you got the right network of people who keep you sane? Have you got the right amounts of routines that make you feel safe and comfortable in life? Have, like there's like, because you're right, like there'll be a lot of entrepreneurs who will have all sorts of mental health issues, they'll have breakdowns. And so just that awareness of how you, because they'll never be, orderly right they'll never go and sit in a nine to five job we all need we can't just exist in fragmentation all the time so that was just a really good mental model that worked for me might not work for everyone but i i just i just thought it was a really great analogy and tool on how to live life Mm -hmm. you obviously work with quite a few entrepreneurs and founders in you know companies you invest in is that something that you, you see commonly with them and like what advice do you normally give them yeah so on mentally surviving i think that um th- the main one is network of people around you and i think that uh, one, of the, one of the main things i actually say is it's one of my favorite equations in the world um it, it's about vulnerability so the ability to show vulnerability is the great hallmark of any leader and it also helps keep you sane. So there's a, there's a brilliant book. It's actually about, it's called the five dysfunctions of a team. Um, but I just found, I guess I pulled an equation out of it, which just makes total sense to me, which is vulnerability equals safety equals trust equals the ability to have conflict and debate. And then you can sort of get somewhere. And the point of it is that, and and it's really about creating the right environment. So I'll give you an example. So whenever people go, look, I'm not so sure about how to do something, it creates the kind of environment where people can feedback and talk to each other rather than everybody just pretending everything's okay. And, you know, and, and, and it creates this environment of trust. And when people, you know, it's not complicated, it's feedback loops, it's people talking to each other. It's that, and it creates the environment of trust, which means people can actually have debate and talk about less difficult things and i guess you know that that's about how teams work but i guess you know just translating that to humans it's very it's very easy for entrepreneurs to have to think that they are invincible all the time and actually having those people around you where you can be vulnerable where you can have a chat and the person at the other end can just listen and can just go, well, of course, like you're not expected to take this all on yourself. It's a crazy thing. And actually it's probably not great leadership. It's one of the, and you know, I'm talking specifically CEOs. I think it's one of this, these great myths. That it's one of the hardest things to drill out of CEOs that they have to be the strong man all the time. Um, there's obviously ways to do it. You can go, look, we're not sure about this. And these are the things that I'm struggling with. And I could use your help with some of these things. Like, I don't know any team that doesn't respond to that because it's fundamentally human um Mm. so so yeah i think the the main thing is the people around you who you can trust call any time and who have the empathy and the feels to 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 listen it's about trust yeah and on the subject of kind of leaders as well so something that you talk about is investing in cult leaders what do you mean by what makes a cult leader? It, it, it's a shortcut, really. Uh, and, and I'll give you the reason for the shortcut. So, uh, and I actually, you know, nicked with permission the phrase off a guy called Richard Burton, who's far more uh, bright and intelligent than me. But cult leader is a shortcut for three things, really. It's, um, what does it mean? So at the start of a company, you've got nothing. You've got no resources. You just have a vision, right? So what do you have to do? Well, you have to sell. You have to sell your vision to investors. You have to sell to potential employees um, and you have to sell to clients, assuming you have clients. So you have to have that ability to bring people on board with you. If you don't have that, you basically have nothing. You're not going to create a company. Um, So, you know, it's a shortcut um, really for those kind of people who we feel are able to do that. It's a kind of, for me, it's a necessary but not sufficient. Um, the other thing that I, I really, really value, like, again, at the early stage, I think a lot of people lose, it sounds quite glib to say, but it's the truth. 
people get distracted and forget that the only thing that matters is making a product that people want. And so the other thing that I love is product focused founders. Uh, it, it also tends to mean that, you know, what else do product focused founders do? They tend to understand users. They have an empathy for users, which is always good. They have more chance of getting to product market fit quicker. So they've got more chance of getting from C to A. Um, and I think they tend to have a culture where they, because of, you know, they have to understand users, uh, where they understand uh, people more. So they tend to build better cultures. So again, these are just shortcuts. There's a million multivariate things that go into investing in tech companies. Um, but th those are definitely two shortcuts that I look for. Mm. Yeah. And something else that I want to talk about is your journey to where you are today, because something that you've kind of written about is how obviously you earlier this year left the bakery and it was quite like a journey of self-discovery for you. And you've, you've, you know, you've written about it on Medium about, you know, spending a lot of time just like with yourself thinking, giving yourself the space to like, just think and play and explore things and all of that kind of process. What I want to know is like, how did you, how do you overcome that kind of the fear of the unknown? Like, how do you allow yourself to be in that state of like, I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to sort of float around here for a while and see what happens. Cause that's, that's like very scary for a lot of people. I think the, the, the fear is very real because, you know, I, I talked earlier about psychological safety and I, I had to get rid of, you know, certain hangups. I had to get certain hangups over certain hangups about money i had to get over certain hang-ups of well what will i do with the time this thing about being a journalist what is my thing and so really if i think back i probably spent about <laughs> what i really did was i spent a year trying to and i don't know how to say this without being woo i tried to spend a year where i just listen to put my energy where I most wanted to go at that specific time and trusted it. It was that simple. So I tried to, there's a Mark Andreessen thing which says, you know, uh, try and keep your diary as clear as possible because that enables you to work on the thing that you have most energy with at that exact time. And so I did that, but I applied it to life. So if I felt like writing, I had something to write, I wrote. If I felt like meeting somebody who seemed interesting on LinkedIn that was random, I met them. Uh, and through that process, lots of interesting things happened. I was introduced to a magician from Australia who for about a four week period really helped me understand some things about myself. Totally random. I helped him start a podcast. He helped me see the world in a different way. There was a great guy called Constantine who just appeared. He was a startup, but he just appeared out of nowhere. And he said, I'll life coach you for a bit for free. And I was like, really? And I think, again, we only had three sessions. That was really cool. There was like this weird thing where this energy healer appeared for like a two week period. And we chatted like five times because she just responded to a LinkedIn post. And again, she just had another perspective on the world. And all this was really just, I think it was just a process of bringing out myself. I wrote loads. I meditated loads. I went to bed trying to lucid dream by setting intentions. And I remembered lots of things from my childhood, like stupid things like, when my dad took my train set away and how that made me feel that I'd forgotten, like being dumped by someone when I was 13 year old and sort of feeling the pain of that. Like it, I, I, I can't even tell you that I had a fucking great process that I followed other than I played around. I gave myself permission to explore and I went where my energy went at that exact time. That's it. And I, I, I don't even know what I mean when I say this, but it felt like a process of dissolving the ego somewhat. I stopped feeling a lot of the, the need to strive and the feeling of not good enough. And I just feel just more serene and peaceful. And by the way, that's how I feel right now, right? My world might go into chaos any second. So I don't claim to have cracked anything. All I can do is report on my own experiences of some of the things that seem to help me along the way. And of course, there's stuff like grief in your life as well, right? When bad things happen, you're really forced to go to the underbelly, face your shadow, and really try and understand who you really are and, uh, and face up to, you know, uh, things that are hard. Yeah. And uh, so 
I'm of the opinion that I think we're obviously in a very weird time at the moment because everyone's everyone's sat at home. We've been sat at home for months um, because of this pandemic. And it's obviously a very, very stressful, chaotic time. But I at least hope that maybe one of the silver linings to all of this is that actually people are now in a way forced to sit with themselves and have that unsure space where they're, they're thinking about all those kind of things. Like I found myself very weirdly thinking about like things that happened to me ages ago that I've not thought about for a while, but I don't know, they've just suddenly kind of come back to me now. I've got more time on my hands, I suppose. So yeah, I'm of the opinion that hopefully a silver lining to all of this is that more people uh, yeah, are forced into this space and maybe we'll come out the other side having a bit of a better understanding about who they are and, and where they want to be. I hope so. Like, you sound quite aware, but we've lost the ability just to sit. Like, mm. it's like, where's the next dopamine hit coming from? Whereas, actually, if you just sit, and you sit with yourself, which is the hardest thing for most people because, you know, they, 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 it can hurt. Um, and it can force you to explore some things. But I don't know. I think there's a time, for me, there was just in a moment and you probably speak to some clients like this, they're probably at a moment where they're almost like exploding with, you know, if they let themselves inside, they're exploding with energy somewhere to put in some direction. And I would encourage people to just give themselves permission, give themselves permission to explore. What, a, a great tool that I used was there's a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And the book's fine. Some people get something out of the book. To be honest, it's really the writing technique. And the writing technique is every day, all you have to do is three sides of paper and just don't take the pen off the page. Because people who write, you often get this thing where, oh, I don't want to write, and you stop. The only rule is you just write. And you go, you know, I need to take the bins out today and that satellite dish looks really weird and I don't know why my dad said that to me. And, oh, my God, there's something that came, like you said, from my <laughs> And you just keep writing. Um, I found that, among other things, just really, really useful i learned how to i tried things like meditation techniques a guy called vinay gupta who's got like a really good thing on that but I, I think the main thing is people just giving themselves permission and going with it and searching and exploring and going with it that's it uh and then you'll find the tools and the things you need and the people you need to speak to and the things you need to write but i think there's a very small amount of people who actually do this I think. Yeah, I think, well, it's funny that you were saying earlier, like, I don't know how to say this without sounding woo-woo, because -woo, I yeah. think a lot of people do see it like that. But actually, I don't know, I see it more as a process of self-development and self-improvement rather than hippy-dippy weird stuff. But I think that you're right, like a lot of people, I think, do. Um, but, well, just to say on I that, think... I, I, I came to a conclusion on that, which I'd love your thoughts on, which is, you know, there's a lot of things that speak to me, whether it's like Eckhart Tolle, the power of now, or there's, there's, there's Taoism, and there's things that just speak to us that aren't empirically provable, right? Because they're things that happen in the mind. But I've come to two conclusions about this, which is the things that happen in your mind that aren't empirically provable are as real as anything, right? They are real experience. We live in this world of scientific and objectivity, and can you prove things? That, that's sort of on one side. But on the other side, I've decided that People, people find their own ineffable language to describe things. Why some people believe in ghosts, some people believe in the soul, some people believe in, you know, spiritual awakenings of sort, you know. And what I've learned to do is, I've learned to go, well, the language they use may be wrong and not provable, but the experiences they talk about are very real to them. So how I've done it is I've just gone, if there's anything that speaks to me, I'll try it. And if the experience has a value to me somehow, then that is good. I don't necessarily have to try and dress it up in some language and prove my view of the world, or I can just be skeptical about the language they use, but just understand how they either get that solace or get that process of discovery. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it makes sense, but I just worked out that the language people use to describe these things is subjective and often sometimes sometimes crazy sometimes nonsense but it doesn't make that experience any less real for them and therefore everyone should just try and see what works for them to understand themselves better and some people will go scientific they'll have like to-do lists and things like that 
other people might do gong baths and meditation retreats like whatever works yeah i agree so something else kind of on a related topic as well is i think you have spoken a, a bit on social media about separating your sense of worth and your sense of self from your job and i think that's something that i kind of relate to in my entrepreneurial adventures and i left my business and i found it very very difficult because my i kind of realized that i'd basically connected my identity with a company that i was creating and it was very difficult um so it's something that really resonates with me but also on the flip side i think that when you're doing meaningful great work it can really fulfill you and give you a lot of value so how do you tread that line between finding work really fulfilling that gives you a lot of value and also not having your whole self-worth caught up in your job I, I, the first thing to say is i don't think it's easy uh and you know if i if i just talk about my own experiences so i was 30 i had an anxious episode i got i got divorced and my work and i'd wrap my whole i'd been i'd wrap my whole self in work from day one since i was 20 right i was in uh, a, a comms company mc Saatchi. Um, and you know, for the first time in a decade, I was feeling like I was failing and I'd sort, I always used to say, I never really felt like I failed before. And so it was like a big moment. Um, and I didn't really know what to do. And so really like where I am now is a dec at least a decade worth of looking at this stuff. And it's, you know, I've tried loads of things, tried psychotherapy, I've tried, I've talked about a bunch of the things. So the first thing to say is. I don't think it's a light switch, right? I don't think you suddenly can switch it off and get um, and, 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 and take all of your worth out of your work. And, and let's be clear, by the way, work is a very important thing to a lot of people to give their life meaning, right? So, so it, it's understandable why people do it. But what we're really talking about is extremes. It's when you put your whole self in and if that fails, you fail too. Um, and so the short answer of what I've learned on that is you just, you just have to have a healthy detachment from it. And it's really working on the mind, you know, we're just, and, and, and people do this in different ways. Some people have mantras, you know, we're just monkeys on a rock flying through space to help give them perspective. Um, other people have certain practices. Other people have good family around them that grounds them. Like there's, everyone will have their own journey to, a healthy state of mind but just through my own experiences it's just a lot of work um it's just a lot of work to get there um and and it's also good to have things that give you worth outside of your work right and just mm. not putting all of your time and energy to it um so I, I don't necessarily have one specific answer other than first thing be aware right again <laughs> seem quite aware but the moment you are aware that's what you're doing, you can solve it. I wasn't aware until I was 30. When I became aware, I started breaking down all of these mental models that I had that were, uh, were holding me back. Do you think that, I feel like we're kind of in a world where everyone, everyone's like creating stuff, everyone's progressing, everyone's shouting about how amazing they are on LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff. Do you think that we're in a comparison trap in a way and we put so much worth on our work because everyone else is shouting about how amazing they're doing. Of course. It's like, we, we don't judge our things by absolutes. We judge it relatively. So, you know, Barack Obama probably wishes in some ways he was Mark Zuckerberg. You know, we have this thing where we compare ourselves to others and, you know, it's not healthy. We all know what Instagram does to suicide rates. We all know that everyone really, if you look underneath it is, you know, has a story somewhere. Um, and, you know, my wish for the world is just more like you, you, I, I just see it all as one of the one of the tools that helps me is everything's a game with rules, right? So if you really understand venture and you understand the rules of the game, that's for me, if you go into any field, understand what the rules of the game are and how people are playing it. And you can then choose to play the game. So one of the things I see social as I see it as a game and you can choose, you go, right, how do you get followers? I know. I know exactly how I could get followers. I know the messages that you could write. And I know, and I, I went through a process where I was really, really good at building a following. I've gone through a process where I now try not to do things as clickbait because it now to me with where I am in my life, it just feels like a more false place to be. And I'd rather be me 
than chase clicks. Um, but so, so my point being there that when you understand the game, you know how the game is played, you can then choose how much to participate in that game. So for me, the thing on social and everyone doing it, I'd be going, right, do I do that? But I'd work out, okay, if all these people are pretending they're putting on personas, how do I do that? What would I do? What would I talk about? What would get the most thing that made the outside world seem like I'm really successful, which would help me help give me leverage and help me hire? Like that's a conscious decision that you can make. Um, so yeah, I, in sum, everyone is faking it to make it. Everyone's playing this game. Um, and it does feel a bit inauthentic. It is harmful, I think, to society because I think, you know, just taking it to a further point, I think we're losing empathy for each other um, because we're projecting this, this mask um, to everyone, which is never healthy. Uh, mm. But again, it, it's just the mind. Like if, if you can train yourself to frame it, I think, I think you can train your mind to frame anything. And so if you can frame it as a game, it's just super helpful because it stops, it, it stops, it's a game. You, un, you, you, you don't have to take it so seriously and it just makes everything easier. But it's, again, it take, that might not be right for everyone and it might take a while to get there, but I found that super helpful as a mindset. I really like following you on like LinkedIn and stuff, by the way, because I feel like, while everyone else is just like shouting about how amazing they're doing i see a post from you and i'm just like oh that's made me think yeah like you like you ask like interesting questions and i feel like that's that to me is so much more interesting because you're giving people value or making people think rather than just being like hey i did this yeah i i mean i I hope so and thank you for (laughs) saying that like it's um i it just amazes me linkedin like because they still do it so two years ago i just looked at it and i'm like Everyone is so boring. Everyone is just like virtue signaling the, how fucking smart they are with the Harvard Business Review. This is actually one of the key insights. Like one of the things I stopped doing was I stopped trying to prove how smart I was. Now that might sound trivial and it might sound trite, but when you work out that your job is to make the other person sound smarter in any room, okay? And your job is to get that out of them and you don't need to socially signal how smart you are. For me, that changed a lot because I was always competing to be the smartest. So I was like, well, if I'm smart, then everyone will respect me and like me. If you look on LinkedIn, maybe people fucking love it. I couldn't be more bored by people going, you know, look at this in the Harvard Business Review. I don't know, who cares? Who cares? And aren't we really grateful? I'm like, who cares? Uh, So it still amazes me though. I mean, I don't really look at LinkedIn feed much, but I get the impression that people still sort of do that. How great am I credentialing? I'm like, who cares? We all do that to a bit because of course we want recognition. Of course we want to share the good things we've done with the world. It's just when you trot it out all the time and are frankly a bit dull with it, that's not so great. Yeah. Me. On another note, I saw on the bakery website, it says it's no longer just the mavericks and outliers who start businesses. It's become one of the top career choices for many of the most talented and ambitious people. So my question is, why do you think that so many talented and ambitious people these days are seeking out more entrepreneurial careers than kind of ever before, really? I mean, I think there's a confluence of reasons, right? Let's try and go through them. So let's take number one. It's sexy, right? So, you know, if you read any VC thing, you think all these entrepreneurs are gods, you know, there, there is a very good PR job that the industry does that goes, this is sexy. Second thing, like it is the high growth industry. Like I always think that people should think about what industry they go in. Like, should I go into journalism now? Maybe not. Maybe you should go into tech. Like I think that being part of a rising tide is always, it's so much nicer when you're in growth mode than when you're in laying people off and having heart mode. So I think number two, it is, obviously where the future is and is the high growth industry. So I think that's number two. I think number three is that um, as a society, we've lost meaning. So I think, you know, without trying to sound too punchy, Nietzsche, and I'll probably butch this, but Nietzsche said something like, you know, um, I can't remember the quote, but basically with the, with the decline in religion, giving us a shared meaning in all of our lives, he's like society will crumble and fragment. 
because we'll all go into our little tribes and we will lose this shared sense of the thing that we all believe. And so I think, you know, people going and doing their own thing makes their lives feel more meaningful. Um, so I definitely think there's been a shift to that. Um, and number four, it's easier, right? So like, or number five, can't remember how many I've done. Uh, it's easier. Like imagine trying to start a startup when you're in, in, I don't know, in the night, even the 1990s, early 2000s, you have to buy a <laughs> server to put your computer. It costs loads of cash just to do that. Like coding is really, really hard. Uh, like how the hell do you get your message out there? Do you have to buy a TV ad? Do you have to buy a radio ad? Do you have to buy a print ad? Like the amount of, uh, it's just way easier now to build a startup because everybody has a computer in their hand. They have, everyone has access to audience through social, incredible tools, incredible targeting. Um, and it's just way, you just get an Amazon web server. Like, so you got a laptop, you got an Amazon web server, you got access to Twitter, Facebook, you can start a company. Uh, so basically a confluence of all those reasons. Pretty good answer, wasn't it? I'm surprised by that. Yeah. Right. And what kind of, obviously, you know, you work work with a lot of sort of entrepreneurs and and everything. Are you seeing any kind of like trends or changes over the past sort of few years in terms of entrepreneurs and the companies that they're starting? Uh, I don't think I'm ridiculously insightful in that. I mean, there's obviously trends towards more things in AI. Obviously, there's crypto stuff. Obviously, there's a remote work thing going now. I think the more interesting thing is just about the, the key thing for me is just the bottom of the funnel. So the UK talent uh, stack or the talent pool is way inferior to say the United States. The thing that I love, and I think the thing that has been brilliant is that, you know, things like the EIS scheme, which I think is, has been a genius thing to, to, to kickstart entrepreneurism and technology in this company. And I think just the number of people who have had a go, who might fail the first time, but now understand user experience, they understand product, they understand raising money, like learning by doing. So I just think that it's really encouraging me the amount of the people that people will learn at the bottom of the funnel um, is, is incredible. And I think, you know, it's that just that classic thing, like if you've worked in an, corporate a lot of the time, maybe you're a middle manager, you don't spend your time doing and learning a lot of things. You're just very good at shuffling people and papers and arguments around. Like that's just a fact. Um, when you just go out and you have to do just the speed of learning, the amount of learning that will compound in your life is incredible. So one of the things I think for people who start startups is, and the people who are scared, I just think the thing where you compare it to an MBA for two years, you set aside an amount of money you don't have to earn if you can afford to do it. And you just treat it like the best freaking educational experience you'll ever have because you learn so much. And that will just make you way more useful to way more people in the rest of your life. Uh, because you have to learn everything. You have to learn finance, fundraising, product, growth, marketing, sales, uh, and you have to do it all yourself. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Uh, so, and again, that's a mindset thing, right? So the fear that the people you talk about, a lot of it is just, well, what's the downside? You'll learn loads in two years. It's amazing. What a great, but you, you then have to psychologically have that comfort blanket. What will I do for money? Blah, 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 which I don't necessarily have an answer to for everyone. So everyone's got their own risk tolerances. What is your opinion of going and, and doing, you know, MBAs and stuff like that, which obviously a lot of, a lot of people do do. What is your opinion of going and doing that and learning for a year, two years, you know, how, how long it is versus just going and doing something? I think it depends what you want. Like if you do want to get a job at strategy at McKinsey or whatever, fine, go do an MBA, whatever. Um, if your goal is to, you know, you might, you know, again, it depends how people describe me, you might want to do something more meaningful that's more tuned to what you want in the world, or you might want to, you know, start your own business one day. Like it just depends. Is this, <laughs> I used to ask on LinkedIn, you know, should there was a mate who wanted, he said, should I do an MBA? Should I start a startup or should I can't remember the third one, do something else. And, uh, the amount of debate it caused, it's like one of those classic <laughs> questions that everyone's like shouting over each other. I just think it depends what you want. Like if it's like, if it's, 
real world applicable learning, um, I think, and if you have the risk tolerance, I think you learn way more in a startup. So you learn practice, right? You learn the real world. You don't learn theory. It's not to say MBAs are bad. MBAs have a bunch of really good models. But I think the other thing with an MBA is it costs loads of cash. Uh, so I don't know if the return on investment would be as good. Mm. Yeah, such a good debate. Yeah, it definitely gets people rolled up. I might stick out <laughs> what people think. I haven't said clickbait anymore. um okay so uh final question can you tell us anything about yeah sure potential potential well so so what's my purpose in life so um the thing that really gets me that i've learned is the gap between who people are and who they can be is infinite like what changes the world most i don't think it's tech company right software is a good efficiency machine it's great but you know what really changes the world is people realizing their in infinite capacity to improve. And I just go, if you could wave a magic wand and got everybody to overcome their fears, their doubts, to do, um, to do more of the things they wanted to do without fear, I just go, what kind of a great world would that be? And you gave them uh -huh. the in the sport. So um, my current plan is I'm currently, so I still invest with Search Invest, but I've also, there's a company called Redbrain which is the company that no one's heard of that's one of the top five growing companies in Europe. So they've gone from zero to 25 million in two years revenue wow. and 12 and a half million profit in two years. Um, and so the goal there is, well, if, if I can help really build that company up, um, there's a founder there called Doug, and if one day they exit, we will have a, a slush fund of cash. And with that cash, it'd be really interesting to do a model that, doesn't start with the VC hypothesis because the VC, the VC is great. VC works for the 1% and VC works for people who just want to go, boom, you know, the answer is growth, grow as fast as you can do that. There's a whole bunch of people who that model may not work for, for a bunch of reasons. So I basically start with the premise of, okay, take away those economic incentives. If the goal was to get people from there to there, then you had the resources to help them to do that money, belief, education, you know, it might even be venture, like who knows, depends on the person. What model would you build around that? And how would you use it to, you know, that thing about there's 7 billion people in the world, all have talent, not all have access to opportunity. How could you do that at scale? So, so really that, that, that's at the heart of it. And so at the moment you can say that I'm in a, uh, probably a quiet phase before unleashing chaos and fun on the world. <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, things like this, chats like this, like I have a lot of people who just appear on LinkedIn. I like go for walks and I'm like helping people at career crossroads or with things in their life. Like that's the thing that just lights me up. I, I saw, I've coached some VCs on the side just for lols. No one knows that. Um, and I think that, I think that's the thing, like, and it comes back to like everyone's purpose in the end, if they really go deep enough, I think it's helping people. And, you know, you, you, you were telling me before the show that you, 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 you've sort of got that and you understand that, but I just think it's, it's innate in everyone. And so, uh, and so, yeah, that's what I'll be doing. It sounds very exciting. I can't wait to hear and see the, uh, the chaos unleashed. Stay tuned. Awesome. Well, um, that was amazing. I really enjoyed our chat. Thank you very much for your time. Um, before we go, can you tell everybody how they can find out more about you, connect with you, sure. float into your life? The best way is probably um, Alex Dunstan, Alex Dunstan on both Twitter and LinkedIn. I tend to post something every day there. So uh, you can join in the fun there and message me on the DMs. It's probably the best way. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I really hope you found our conversation as interesting as I did. All the resources mentioned will be in the show notes below. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to us if you're able to support by giving us a quick rating and review to help more people find us. We also now have an awesome weekly newsletter where we'll send you one email a week with things like blogs, useful resources and invites to our free workshops to help support you on your journey to creating a remarkable career and life worth telling stories about. 
to subscribe, just head to www.uprise.academy forward slash newsletter and drop your email in. Next week, we chat to Jevan Pradas, author of The Awakened Ape, all about how we can improve our mental and physical health and create more fulfilled lives by looking back at our evolution from hunter-gatherer tribes. It's a great episode, so hit subscribe to make sure you don't miss it, and I'll see you there.